Good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us tonight for Library Lovers with Maya Linnell. I'll begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. I extend this respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. This event is brought to you by Overdrive. You may already be familiar with our platform of the same name through which you can borrow magazines, audiobooks, and eBooks. The Overdrive app is Libby. If you have questions regarding Overdrive or Libby, please contact your local library. Feel free to comment or ask questions via the chat and you can see the chat icon there at the bottom of your, towards the bottom of your screen. I'll be monitoring the chat so I can pass on relevant questions to Maya, the host and her guests. I'll now introduce Maya Linnell, best-selling fiction writer of three wonderful rural romances. Maya's new book, Paperbark Hill, will be published on the 31st of May. Her books are available in paperback and ebook and in ebook and audiobook via the Libby app. Maya is, in her own words, a writer, baker, and green thumb. And I shall now pass you over to Maya. Wonderful. Thank you, Maya. Thank you very much for the lovely introduction, Julianne. And thanks so much to everyone for joining us tonight. It really is such a thrill to be heading up a new program for people that love books, that love gardening, and that love baking as much as I do. So it really is a pleasure to be with you tonight for the inaugural event of Library Lovers. Now, as Julianne mentioned, I'm your host, Maya Linnell. And when I'm not writing rural fiction for Alan and Unwin or kid wrangling, I'm out in my big country garden or I'm baking up a storm or reading either in paperback or via audiobooks. Um, I've been a lifelong library lover myself and it gives me great joy today to be chatting with you tonight and our very special guests to talk about all things writing, baking, gardening and the magic of libraries. I hope you've got a cup of tea ready. So sit down, get comfy. We have a very fantastic star studded lineup. As Julianne said, please feel free to ask questions. Um, we'll have a little bit of time after each guest to try and get through some of those questions. And of course, if there's something that you've put up that we don't get a chance to get to, then we'll be able to take note of that question and answer it at a later date. So without further ado, I'd love to invite our first guest, Sophie Hansen, on. Now, the lovely Sophie Hansen is a food and features writer. Now, she lives on her family's farm near Orange in New South Wales. Her new cookbook, Around the Kitchen Table, is out next month with Murdoch Books. It's available through bookstores and libraries in hard copy and also digitally through the Libby app. And we are so thrilled to have you on our very first Library Lovers event. Sophie, welcome. Oh, hey, Maya, thank you so much for having me. I'm very, very excited to be here. Uh, and I'm glad all the stars have aligned and all our technology is working so far, so that's good. <laughs> that's it. it. It really is nice to be able to um, have these chats. And after having spent so much time admiring your beautiful cooking um, and your Instagram feed is amazing. So if there's anyone out there who hasn't yet heard of Sophie, and just needs a beautiful dose of beautiful baked goods or rustic farm life, country kitchen, then you need to head out and find a Sophie straight away. Um, one of the books that Sophie has out, her most recent release, which came out last year, is In Good Company. And we'll talk a little bit more about that tonight because I have a very soft spot for this book. I've baked many good things from inside the cover. Um, I describe these beautiful books, Sophie, to my friends as a bit of a cross between a recipe book and a photo album because it's filled with so many beautiful pictures. Can you tell us briefly how you came to this career producing such beautiful cookbooks? Oh, well, thank you so much for your very, very kind words. Um, so I didn't grow up in the country. I'm a, I'm a city girl, actually. And uh, when I met my husband, I was, well, then 
um, I was 29 and I had had a career in food magazine. So I did journalism at, at university um, <clears throat> and I worked as a features writer for various food and lifestyle magazines sort of throughout my 20s. Had a few years working overseas in Italy for a, a magazine there. And I came home and um, found myself um, in love with a farmer and moving to the country and we were doing farmers markets every weekend we have um farmed we have red deer on our property and we have a venison business so we're doing farmers markets and i'll go to the markets and create a newsletter and create recipes and take photos and um and i sort of started to think oh, i would be really amazing if you could put all these recipes not just ours but all the other stall holders in the one place so i started a blog called local is lovely and it all kind of evolved from there there was no great plan at all but it was just you know, needing to kind of find an off-farm income and, and having sort of a love of storytelling. So it kind of worked somehow. <laughs> <laughs> well, lucky for us, I suppose, and for all the pe people whose beautiful recipes you've featured, there's there's so many great um, tributes to different people in amongst your books. And I love that. I love making um, the apple pie and knowing that it's Nani's apple pie. And that was passed down to one of your friends from his grandmother, that's right? her grandmother but her husband Derek took on the mantle of making it so um yeah that's a really special recipe I've got a very soft spot for that and I, I know that you've made it a couple of times too it's really lovely yeah look it's the first apple pie that I've made that can kind of stand on its own weight once it's sliced yeah. it looks like it belongs in a cafe yeah yeah it's great isn't it I love it too I wish I could claim responsibility for that one but it's totally Nani's Nani's beautiful recipe. <laughs> <laughs> now, we've had so much fun road testing the beautiful recipes in, in good company. And so I've happily traveled down lots of website rabbit holes and downloaded playlists based on your newsletter, which you briefly touched on. But that newsletter, it's not just a small thing. You downplay that. That's a wonderful thing that really perks up people every single week with um, five things to be cheerful about on a Monday. It really is lovely. Um, with putting that together, there's so much great content. How do you go about weeding out the things to, to ensure that you're getting such great variety and narrowing it down? Well, look, I de definitely don't always get it right, but I think I just kind of, I always try and think, I, I only share stuff that really tickles my fancy. And I always, I always say this to people, I, I write for a certain person I have, and her name is Sally, and she's a made up person, but I, Sally's very much like me. She's like one of my good friends. And I always think, oh, would Sally like this show? Would Sally like this playlist? And if, if that passes the Sally test or my test, I pop it in. But yeah, I mean, I certainly don't get it right. And, you know, sometimes um, I'll recommend a playlist that maybe is like a bit weird and not, not everyone loves it, but that's okay. And, you know, there's um, different strokes for different folks. But yeah, I do love putting the, playlist, the, the newsletter together. It's really good fun. Yeah, it's a great place to be just to perk people up on a Monday morning. Now, one of the things that I really loved is your new release is something that you've written with your mum. Now, that's a really yeah. nice thing to be able to do. So your mum's an yeah. art teacher, isn't she? An art teacher and an artist. Yep, Annie Heron. And um, yeah, I still get goosebumps when I see both our names on the cover. It's really um very special actually so yeah it was a real joy to do this book with mum and it's filled throughout with these most beautiful images and not just recipes but we're talking about techniques on how to do painting um ways to capture different crafts at different times of the year there were so many lovely things what was it like co-authoring a cookbook with your mum Oh, look, it was a real dream. And, you know, mum, mum's a very accomplished artist and we both luckily have a real love of colour and, um, you know, and, and sharing, I guess, what we, what we love. I've got my copy here. Um, so it was great. I mean, it was not without its challenges because we did it during lockdown last year. Um, so we weren't able to be together as much as we wanted to be. Mum lives two hours away from me. Um, but we made it work. And every time there's a little kind of gap in the lockdowns, we'd sort of zip around and get to see each other and do photo shoots and things. But um, yeah, it was great. And um, we're now filming a whole bunch of videos for the company companion website because there are a lot of um, techniques and art concepts and baking recipes and things like that that we really wanted to show people as well in video. So, yeah, it's a really exciting time. Oh, fantastic. I can't wait to tune in and, and have a look and really brush up on my art skills. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, mum's big thing is that anyone can draw and anyone can learn to paint and draw. You just got to practice. So hopefully the book's full of little inspirational kind of prompts to get started. And I did. I got that vibe, Sophie, as I was reading through it. I'm not particularly arty. I love a bit of craft, love a bit of, um, you know, sticking some things on a page and calling it a scrapbook. But um, even I felt like I might be able to paint or draw whilst I was reading through with those really lovely descriptions on, on how to go about it. So I certainly okay. encourage you to race out and, and find a copy when it's released on March the 29th, isn't it? So only a couple of weeks away. Yeah. I know we're really, yeah, it's very exciting and scary at the same time. I find this part of the process, it's no breaking. <laughs> Yeah, well, I imagine your home was a hive of creativity when you're growing up. Is that true? Um, if you've got an artist as a mum and there's always beautiful cooking around? Yeah, definitely. Mum's always, um, always created. She went to art school. She taught um, art. as a, She was an art teacher at various schools when we were little, but she, famously there was a story of, um, you know, those like play pens that you used to put the kids in when they were toddlers. She'd actually get in that with her paints and paint and all four of us and sort of scrounge around outside. I don't know if that's just family kind of um, a bit made up. But, yeah, definitely mum. Um, we grew up in a very colourful, very creative uh, house. Mum's always doing something and would often get us involved. And, and hence the name of the book, Around the Kitchen Table, because, you know, you can't always sort of go to a beautiful, perfectly set up studio and create, you know, sometimes it just has to be in the middle of life. And so you know, whether it's just doing a quick line drawing or, you know, I mean, there's lots of different ways to be creative. There's some really fun drawing challenges in the book as well. Um, yeah, so it's all kind of interspersed with recipes and stories, but uh, definitely grew, was really, really lucky to grow up in a house where creativity was um, made a priority. That's wonderful. I think it shines through. Um, we've had a couple of comments. Beck Brown said she saw um, the new book around the kitchen table on my Instagram feed and she's requested her library to buy it. So, which of course they did, oh, which is wonderful. Beck. That's Beck in Geelong. Thank you, Beck. I appreciate it. I hope you like it. And Mary Lou said your weekly newsletter is lovely too. So that's wonderful. Mary Lou, thank you so much. Beautiful. And there's been a question about whether people can pre-order it as well. Sophie, is that something that's open already? Yeah, pre-orders are definitely open. In fact, Mum and I are going in to sign them all at um, Booktopia tomorrow. Um, so you can absolutely pre-order. Um, but, yeah, it's only a couple of weeks um, until it's on the shelf. So I'd also encourage you to go to the library or your local independent bookshop or wherever you like to get your books. Hopefully it will be there um, in just a matter of weeks, which is exciting. Beautiful. Now, speaking of books, Sophie, can you tell us what type of books that you loved when you were a little girl? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, when I was really little, I guess it was kind of um, no great shapes here. Lots of Ended Blyton. I was obsessed with the Twins of St. Clair's and Mallory Towers. They were my thing. And then, um, actually, I was talking about this the other day with someone. They moved into those sort of, I hate to even admit it, but those, you know, Sweet Valley High books and all those sorts of tween teen books. Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, <laughs> um, and I found Mama kept stuck in my old Sweet Valley Highs the other day, which was hysterical. Uh, but yeah, books like that. I think um, we we had, I'm one of four, so we, there was a lot of rotating books around. So often I'd read, you know, what my brother had just finished or what my older sister had just finished. So I guess we just sort of read what was lying around. But um, we, we certainly, we're all really avid readers. My, both my brothers, my sister and I are really uh, um, big on reading and I think, that's the thing and, and also we used to spend a lot of time in the car um, and we used to listen to a lot of books and I think I have a lifelong love of audiobooks as well so yeah we're very lucky. <laughs> yeah look I think um, back to those days when the audiobooks were on the you know the 10 CDs or back sorry even further when they're on cassettes yes. or not. Yeah. It's, um, it's a great way to travel. I find it the same it's a good distraction for the children it stops the bickering. Um, mm. it from their devices and at least they're looking out the window and and thinking oh yes we're going through another town or we've you know got another couple of kilometers of Koorong 100 kilometers of Koorong to go with nothing to see but at least they've got a good book going absolutely and um you know the imagination is going as well I think movies don't leave anything to the imagination and that's what I love about books and audio books so yeah we're we're big fans. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, I've listened to several episodes of your podcast, Something to Eat, Something to Read. 
And it's really yeah. great company on my morning walk. So I'll be going across the beach at dark o'clock with the dog. And I've got you and your friend who's a bibliotherapist in my ear talking about books and really examining them. Uh, can you tell for those people who haven't listened to the podcast yet, can you give us a bit of a snapshot? Oh, thank you for mentioning that. Yeah, so the podcast is quite new. We're just about to kick off the se next season, actually. Um, and I do it with my friend, Jermaine Lease, who's a bibliotherapist. So she's a psychotherapist and she, with her therapy, she prescribes texts for people to read that might help them contextualise something they're thinking about or going through. So um, the name of the, the podcast really comes from a friend of mine's mum who lived on property out west and her big the motto in life was never leave the house without something to eat and something to read and you'll never be bored and you'll never get stuck. So um, that was kind of the idea of the podcast. So we have a reader letter or a listener letter um, and we prescribe, I prescribe a recipe in Jermaine a book and then we chat about a book that we love and, and the role that food plays in that book. So it's been really fascinating, the role that food, you know, a book that you might not necessarily think is a particularly foodie book, um, the way food can kind of escalate or de-escalate the, the momentum sometimes is really, really interesting. So, yeah, it's really fun. We love doing it. It's definitely a passion project. And there's the opportunity for read, uh, for listeners to write in as well. You've got the listener letter and I was in tears one walk listening to someone's um, letter and, and it was just beautiful the way that it was addressed and spoken about. So I think you've got a really lovely thing going on there that's really warm and inviting for people to join in. Thank you. Well, we, we really enjoy it doing it um so it's nice to know that some people like it <laughs> we, it's quite new to us. we haven't actually pushed it out into the world as much as we should have so hopefully people will stumble across it in their travels and after this wonderful now going back to cooking I know some people are put off by the idea of cooking and there's lots of nervous home cooks around there do you have any advice Sophie for people that are beginner cooks or they might be a little bit worried about picking up a beautiful book and trying to make a recipe from that recipe book? Yeah, I would say um, keep it simple. Like start, don't kind of go from 0 to 100 and, and go to a super, super chefy, really scary recipe that needs 50 million input, um, utensils. And um, read the recipe. Like it sounds so basic, but read the recipe from beginning to end before you start it because you don't want to get halfway through and, and be cooking something for dinner that then you need to leave in the fridge to rest or whatever for two hours. So definitely read the recipe first and just practice it. Like pick one or two recipes like the apple pie we mentioned before and make it a few times so it's what, what I call like a back pocket recipe. So it's in your back pocket. You know it's going to work. You know you can just pull it out and it will be a success and you can feel great about it. I think a lot of us, you know, everyone gets, some people get quite kind of nervous and think, oh, it's got to be perfect and Instagrammable and like all the shows on TV. It really doesn't. It's just got to be hot and tasty and generous and served, you know, with love. And I think um, we just need to take the pressure off ourselves a bit. Speaking of served with love, Sophie, um, Beck has just weighed in with a comment about your beautiful lemon self-sourcing pudding, which I believe is called Granny Mary's lemon curd pudding from uh, yeah. In Good Company. Thanks, I'm, I'm a firm favourite of that one too. Beck is on a winner there. Uh -huh. It's divine. Yeah, that was my my dad's mum, my Granny Mary, and she um would have us all for Sunday lunch often at her house, and that was her. It was either that or floating islands. So I decided to put that one in the book. But um, yeah, it's a goodie. It's just one of those kind of old classics, really, that everybody loves with some ice cream, maybe. Definitely. Now, can you take us behind the scenes of your test kitchen, Sophie? I kind of picture it to be this beautiful, amazing, um, very controlled environment where you have very precise measurements and there's no mess and someone kind of fusses in and cleans up after you. But I'm sure that's not Aww. actually anything like the, uh, the truth. Can you tell us something that people might I be surprised? Wish. Oh, look, I wish that was the case. I really do. Generally, um, how the recipes sort of come to be is, I mean, unless they're coming from someone like the apple pie and then I'll test it a few times at home, um, I'll make it and really, oh, well, that's a good one. I'll tweak it. So I'll make it a few times um, and write notes as I do and then I'll make it to shoot because I shoot everything here um, and then and then that's the recipe that generally goes in book. You know, and then it goes through a whole editing process as well. We've got food editors, recipe developers and things like that. But, um, I mean, it's just in my home kitchen. You know, I've got a 
pretty tiny little oven that's a bit temperamental. Um, but I kind of think I'm, I'm writing recipes for home cooks, so it wouldn't make sense if I, I would love it, but it wouldn't make sense maybe if I wasn't, if I was in a super fancy commercial kitchen with lots of helpers. Um, but, you know, my kids, it's a bit like water, water everywhere, and I'm not dropped to drink. When I am testing recipes, you know, the kitchen could be full of cakes or sweet things, but there's actually no dinner or, you know, the fridge is full of post-it notes saying, don't touch that, only eat the broken ones, you know. Nobody hasn't been photographed yet, so it's... Um, when I'm shooting, which is not all the time, it can be a bit hectic. And there's definitely to toast and um, dippy eggs for dinner quite a lot on those nights. <laughs> but, yeah, we make it work. And um, hopefully the fact that they're created and tested in a home kitchen means that they're very um, sort of forgiving and, and easy for people to recreate. Well, I feel like perhaps you might have set up cameras in my house because, Sophie, I made this beautiful snacking cake um with oh, it's filled with snack. apples yeah. it's got the beautiful yeah. almonds on top in the middle yeah. you can see the fault yeah. line around there with the apples the homegrown apples and I said to my children yeah. don't you dare touch this until after <laughs> we'll be having it for dessert the moment that we finish library lovers but no one's allowed to touch it and they were very very horrified by that yeah, well, that, that's basically the story of my children's life. <laughs> Poor things, but they eventually, they eventually do get to eat the cake. <laughs> and they eat very well, I'm very sure. Um, so we'll um, be sharing that recipe. That's from uh, the new book, Around the Kitchen Table. We're going to be putting that on our Facebook page, uh, on the Libby app Facebook page. So people will be able to make that themselves, um, get a little bit of a taste for the book. There's also another, oh, beautiful another really lovely dish that we'll be sharing the recipe and it's called Angela's chicken and it's a beautiful tomato-y chicken and I made that for the family and I didn't make them wait I didn't photograph it I um, let them all dive in straight away that was last week a very special treat so we'll share that recipe too um, oh, that's, another one. that's another good back pocket recipe that one Yes, definitely. Now, before we sign off and go for um, some questions, let's quickly talk about libraries. Now, for me, the mobile library bus was a highlight of my primary school days as a country bookworm. And then it became a treasure trove of discovery when I finished all the books in my family's bookshelves. Now, do you have any special memories, uh, Sophie, of going into the library in your formative years or as an adult? Yeah, I mean, both. I've always really, really loved libraries. When we were little, um, um, after school, because mum would teach at a school near our local library, we'd get off the bus at the library and all go down and, and sit and do our homework. Well, in theory, we'd sit and do our homework. Um, and I remember just, I loved that, actually, those library afternoons, and then mum would finish work and come and get us. Um, and actually, as an adult, I use our library here in Orange. We have a fantastic library, and I've written most of all my books in there. When I'm not recipe testing, I like to go have a change of scenery for the writing part. And um, I do love going to our library. And in fact, there's I've got my special seat there. And if someone's sitting in my seat, I'm a bit, hmm, my seat. <laughs> but um, it's, yeah, I love libraries. I love the role they play in communities. And um, yeah, I use ours all the time. Beautiful. So, and actually when I was at uni, I would, I would spend a lot of time in the library. So yeah, there's something special about them, I think. So I'm a big fan. <laughs> and so they've got your books I'm hoping yes yeah they do they do they've been amazing and I've done launches there and yeah I feel very um very fond of all the people at our local library mm. wonderful now um can you give us an Aussie book recommendation just briefly as well Sophie because I know you read a lot yeah well I'm just halfway through this one actually at the moment the last of the apple blossom by Mary Lou Stevens have you read it I have and yeah. I loved it in Tassie yeah, so Tasmania, it's about um, the, um, no, the bushfires in the late 60s and it's really beautiful and, and really um, evocative and, yeah, um, especially now I think it's quite sort of uh, timely for me. So, yeah, I'm really enjoying that one. Oh, beautiful. And Mary Lou is actually tuning in tonight, so she is delighted. She <laughs> says, morning. <laughs> I love your book. It's gorgeous. <laughs> That's absolutely perfect. Now we have a question from Julie, Sophie. She's wanting to know, do you get distracted when you're working in the library? Um, no, I don't really. I kind of put my headphones in and um, and I, I quite like being around people because at home here on the farm, often I'm the only one. It's my dog and I in the kitchen and it's great, but it can get a bit lonely. So I quite like having people around me um, and I, I have 
have the same kind of music I listen to while I'm working and um, no, I quite like having a bit of activity around me. Oh, that's perfect. And Mary Lou says she loves everything that you do. She's thrilled that you're enjoying the last of the apple blossom. So that's wonderful. Oh, how nice that she's online. That's great. That is perfect. <laughs> we didn't rig this up beforehand, I promise. No, definitely not. Oh, good. Well, lovely. I will hold, if anyone's got any further questions for Sophie, you can still put them in the chat and perhaps we'll get to them later if we get a chance. Otherwise, Sophie will get back to you um, later. But thank you so much for being our guest, Sophie. Mm -hmm. And if no, you're looking for your kind work. No worries. You can find Sophie online at Local Lovely. So wonderful. Go find her on Instagram. Thank you, Sophie. Now, our very mm -hmm. next guest is Jenny Baldwin. Now, Jenny is the editor of Gardening Australia magazine, and she has had a wonderful career in magazines. Now, Jenny, if you could turn your camera on and I'll get you to turn yours off, Sophie. And audio on if you don't mind, Jenny. Um, can you hear me? Oh, I can hear you. I do. Yes, I, I, I can't turn my video on. The host has to start it. So. Oh, lovely. Wonderful. Julianne will be on that in two seconds. But whilst we're waiting for your video to fire up, beautiful. Um, <laughs> you've had a wonderful career in magazines, Jenny. I'm so thrilled that you can join us tonight. And before working um, in magazines, you were doing film production with the BBC. You're producing audio books and you even had a stint as a political staffer. Now, that is a very interesting career to come before magazines. Could you please tell us how you came to your current role as editor of Gardening Australia? Sure. Um, yes, they were all previous work lives and that was just a set. There were a lot of different jobs and um, I did do the audio production for some years uh, at Vision Australia, it was the talking books. Um, I started in, I actually worked in uh, trade magazines briefly and then I had a call from a colleague, actually, she's someone who works on the magazine now, um, Sally Feldman. They needed, they needed um, help at Gourmet Traveller magazine and that was my first gig in consumer titles. So I went across and worked on that. So that was at um, what used to be called ACP. I then worked across a range of magazines there, um, including Take Five where I became chief sub. And then I left and had um, my babies and sort of was backwards and forwards freelancing there and then at News Limited. And, and one of those jobs I was uh, booked to do was just a two day stint at Garden Australia magazine. And that was, um, that was in 2007. And I went across, not sure how that would be. I was a, I was a gardener, but a, quite a new gardener. I, I had gardening parents, but, you know, I hadn't done a lot of it myself. Wasn't sure if I'd be able to handle that. You know, there might be technical things I didn't know what to do. But I really felt very comfortable there. So um, after that, that two-day booking turned into another couple of days and so on and and then it just rolled on and then I'd go, as, as it was coming up to an end, I'd go into the editor at the time, Jennifer Stackhouse, and say, I really like it here, I don't want to leave. And she said, well, we like having you, so stay. And then it just, it just kept going. So I kind of settled in and I stopped doing other work, work on other magazines. And, um, and then when, we, when the magazine moved across to the new publisher, Next Media, that was at the beginning of 2015, I came across and, and I took the, um, the, um, the editorship so I've been doing that for seven years. Oh, fantastic. And for, for me, Jenny, Gardening Australia magazine has been one of those staples. It's been the type of thing that I give my mum for Mother's Day or for Christmas. Um, it's the type of thing that my children give to me as a present. It finds its way into my Christmas stocking. I think Santa Claus knows that I love knowing what's going on in the garden. Um, so... I've lost count of the amount of magazines of yours that I've read. It really is wonderful. Can you tell us something that the audience might be surprised to find out about the Gardening Australia magazine team or, or your role behind the scenes? Well, to start with, we're, we're not in the same office as the TV team, for example. Um, they, they're based in Melbourne. We're based in Sydney. Um, but perhaps more interestingly, we are ourselves dispersed. So, um, you know, in the old days, a mag, you know, your magazine team would be largely in that office, on site in that office, but it's different now and it's particularly different since COVID with remote work just becoming normal. 
So we, we, we've got, for instance, we've got a, um, we have one of our sub editors up on Magnetic Island. Um, you know, that's, that's quite far up, that's up in the tropics. We have uh, our horticultural editor, Phil, is in Lismore, and I'm pleased to say he's, um, he still has a house, um, unlike, you know, many, many up there. Um, and then right down to, we have another horticulturist, A.B. Bishop, who works for us from rural Victoria. And then the rest of us are based in Sydney, but some work in the office, some work from home, some do a mix. And um, so we're all, there's a lot of phone calls and emails and so on. So yeah, we're quite dispersed, which means we've got a genuine diversity of experience with gardening in different climate zones. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. I did. I actually did assume that you'd all be um, in that same building with the TV team and everything working together as well. So that's amazing that you can pull it all together and have it so synchronised across both um, platforms. Yeah, yeah. Now, at the moment in my garden, Jenny, I'm all about saving seeds. And I thought I'd save a few of these to show people. These beautiful poppy seeds just absolutely look stunning, don't they? When they're dry. They're so sculptural, aren't they? Oh, they're wonderful. And amazingly, they just get their seeds out by tap, tap, tapping. So I thought I'd bring those for show and tell and then compare them with the really neat columbine aquilegia seeds, which are almost like old lady claws in a way that when you tip them upside down, they, they release the seeds. So I, I love the seed saving. I really liked um, the section in the most current edition, which came out this week, and people can get that either at the news agency or through the Libby app um, on seed saving as well. I was hoping that you might have brought a little show and tell with you today as well. Is that uh, have, propagated? Um, You've got lots of beautiful um, plants in the background there. <laughs> Just on the seed saving, that was one of our favourite um, stories. I mean, we have we always have a lot of favourite stories. You know, each story that, that we see in its final form, we all go, oh, I love this one, and then there's the next one. But, um, yes, the seeds was one of those stories that came together in layers. So we had, we had those wonderful tips from Phil on sowing your winter crops and then we uh, we were encouraging we're encouraging people to get organized with their seeds because who doesn't have just the biggest schmozzle of seeds you know in a box or bag or something um, and then we had you know just well, like what Sophie does where she just lays the pulls the whole plant up lays it down on the ground and then how to get your sunflower seeds out as well so that was quite a nice um, yeah seed feature but um, look my garden I did pick these um, I did pick these, these Chinese lanterns and buddleias to show <laughs> because it's, it's a bit of colour. But um, my garden, we've had, you know, um, look, bear, bearing in mind we're not in a flood zone where I live. We've not gone through the horror, but um, we had a lot of rain, <laughs> unrelenting rain for weeks, and um, everything is actually green overgrown there's very little color but these things have got going quickly um they've they're, they've not been affected but um yes things are, are quite green so and i certainly don't have seed seed heads to play with at the moment unlike you may oh, my lounge room window is actually a homage just down there behind me is that uh, covered i've got dahlia seeds zinnia seeds um cosmos seeds and these you know, lots of these little columbines as well. For the people that couldn't see it last time, um, those are the columbine seeds. So it's it's very neat. I find it fascinating. They look great in an arrangement as well, I find, just as, as they are. They don't need to be flowering because they're so pretty. And isn't it lovely to have seeds that have given you something this season and you know they're going to give you something next season and they've become a client, those plants have become acclimatised to your conditions there. They're the, you know, those ones that have performed well, they're going to perform well again. It's, um, it's the way to do it. Yeah. It's like they just want to grow. I love that theory. And my seed saving box is an absolute mess. I don't have a beautifully um, organized filing system. So I might have to read that article again yeah, yeah. and just, just get some good tips. Yeah, there's some, yeah. I think we've all just got to get a nice, you know, a cheap um, but functional box with compartments. And Phil has even found one with colour coding. So he's, and he's a Virgo. So he's really, really happy because he can get his, get everything in order. That's yeah. fantastic. And I know that some of the different libraries are getting seed saving libraries happening as well, which is really neat. Um, we have the Glenelg libraries just down the road from us. And the Portland library's got a whole wall 
of uh, different seeds that people can just donate and swap. And it, it's really lovely. Geelong's doing it as well, Beck says. Yep, fantastic. Yeah. Now, can you give us a gardening tip going into April, please, Jenny? I'm hoping, um, I know you're not an expert and we'll certainly hold questions that are of the technical nature of gardening until mm -hmm. the June edition when uh, Phil, who's the horticulturalist expert, comes in. Yep. But, um, but can you give us a gardening tip to lead with? Well, look, as we move into April, April is just the most wonderful month of the year for, for most climate zones in Australia. It's still, you've got still got warmth in the soil. Things can really kick on quickly. Um, I mean, in really cold, in really cold zones, you've probably already got your, your veggies in, but for the rest of us, it's just prime time to be planting winter veggies, putting in bulbs, um, and just just doing it, you know, so that you have a lovely spring. Uh, it's that investment in in the rest of the year. So it, it's time to get planting, and that's why we've got a lot of stuff in the April issue around things to do in the patch. Yeah, a bit of a patch special. So yeah, yeah I'd say get on and do it. Definitely, I particularly liked the idea of having um, lots of flowers in amongst your veggies. I've traditionally kept them quite separate, but uh, I'm starting mm. to intersperse mm. some dahlias in next to the um, corn because I know that they'll get some water and yeah I, I think it's a lovely idea to bring that colour. Yeah and that's look it's, it's how I like to garden I, I, I like to mess everything up I have everything in together from flowers and veggies I like to put the natives are in with the exotics and I just um, I love the multicultural garden so yeah. Well, that's wonderful. And if anyone's got any questions, they can put them in the chat as well and we'll try to get them a little bit later. Um, now, moving on to libraries, Jenny, is there anything uh, special about your local library or perhaps you can share a memory uh, of your library from your childhood? Yes, look, I, I mean, I don't, I don't go to the library a lot these days. It's a phase I'm in with the job and so on where, uh, I mean, I don't even read. I, I do read. I have always got a pile of books but I don't read as much as I mean as a child I read prolifically and these days I'm just so full of words <laughs> at the end of the day um it's you know I don't necessarily want too many more but um I yeah libraries I every library I think I just ate them up and i I was thinking about this the other day when mum was talking about her library and that she had something like 12 or 20 books I can't remember it was a big number and I just, it reminded me how when I was a kid, the number of books I could borrow was always uh, a source of either excitement or frustration. So, um, and, I, and I'm always, I mean, I'm comfortable in a library. It's, and, and as a kid, you know, those periods where you had to go to the library for library lesson, for a lot of kids, they might be, um, or for some kids, they might be bludge period. But for me, it was just happy, happy period. So, yeah. I was speaking with um, Anna Mulder on ABC Radio today for Statewide New South Wales, and she had some lovely guests call in and talk about the librarians really influencing people's career and being that supportive um, role model for them and encouraging them as well. So it is, they're quite unsung heroes, aren't they? Absolutely, yeah. And they're often, um, they're often very sort of sympathetic teachers. They're, they're, yeah, they're, they're nice people to be around if you love books. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Mm. Now, I'm sure I'm not the only one who'd love to know what your working day normally looks like, Jenny. Can you give us a bit of a rundown? Do you um, start early in the morning or is it a nine to five or are you out on location shooting things or is it mostly at the desk? Can you give us an insight? Well, um, I tend to start, I mean, it's different whether if I'm working at home, I'll start around nine. But if I'm working in the office, I'll probably rock in about 10, 30, 11. And I like to do a late shift. I prefer to go in late and work late. Um, I might have, there might have been things, I might have been puddling around with things at home and there might have been phone calls and so on. There might, that all stuff might have happened earlier. But um, I actually spread, the, the job does bleed out into you know different parts of the day it's just how it is and weekends and there's texts and messages and things from contributors or whatever but the day the work day is I was thinking it's like a big it's like a big pot of soup and not a nice hand not a nice Sophie Hansen pot of soup but <laughs> one that's got lumpy 
indigestible bits in it, surprises. It's I, I will approach the day with, you know, really clear about the, the things I must do, really important, urgent things, whatever, and I've got a list, you know. It could, it could be six o'clock and that list hasn't been touched because I've been bounced from one thing to another. So I spend a lot of the day on the phone um, talking to contributors or, um, you know, writers, photographers and our staff. Um, you know, everyone's doing different things and I'm just, you know, I'm just having a bit of input here and there. I'll be looking at copy, of course, working on copy. Um, we're always, you know, trying to finesse layouts. We have a wonderful art director, Rachel. Um, so she's, you know, feeding through the layouts and we might tweak here and there. Um, there's also just, there's just business, as editor, there are businessy things to do. There's, you know, someone needs um, something for another, in another part of the business or, you know, whatever. So, um, it's a whole range of, it's just a huge range of, I'm making decisions all day, solving problems, answering questions. Um, yes, it's a, it's a real mixture. It sounds very intricate and uh, lots of great wheels to keep turning. So it all yeah, runs balls in the air. Yeah. <laughs> So I can understand that you certainly don't have um, oodles of time to dedicate to reading, but when you have picked up a book recently, is there anything that you can recommend to us, Jenny? That uh, Yeah, I've, got a, I've always got a few books on the boil. Um, I'll show you what, what I've, this is one I've just finished. Um, that's a book, a nonfiction book about making choices about what you do with your time. It's not about productivity. It's a bit anti-productivity. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, that was um, life-changing. I've been reading this over a long period of time, Martin Amos's. It's a fictionalised novel. It's a fictionalised memoir in a way. Um, big, thick book. You have to keep stopping because he just, there's something that you've just got to think about it for such a long period of time. You know, to, to absorb it. And then there's a book I've got my eyes on to reread. So the, the thing with libraries is I've been treating my, my own collection of books a bit like a library recently. I've been going back to books I read in my 20s, certain ones, and I want to reread them. So this is one of those. So this is called, this is an Australian author, Marion Halligan, Lover's Knots. Um, and this is one that I actually recorded as an audio book when I was in my 20s and working as an audio book producer. The narrator was the wonderful Jenny Valetic, an actress and at the time um, narrator. And I don't remember, like I don't remember the plot, but I re it's like it's like people. You you don't you might not remember what they said, but you remember how they made you feel. And that book made me feel it was it, it just made me feel good things. It was it's very richly layered, beautiful imagery. Again, you have to just stop and you know absorb that little wonderful bit and so I'm sort of in the mood for something like that so that's um, on my bedside table ready to go so I'll probably get into that and keep going with the Martin Amos and just have the two of them ticking along together yeah and do you think it will hold up to the earlier adoration yeah, you I do yeah 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 Oh, that's great. Now, let's finish, Jenny, on a very important question. Well, two, actually. The first one is, are you a bookmark or a, a folding the corner type of person? <gasps> folding the corner. No, 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 no. No, <laughs> no I can't deface a book. Um, and, in fact, when we used to record talking books, um, we, we did. We had to, you know, we had to mark it all up. We had to research the pronunciations and write the phonetic pronunciation for everything. And the narrator was writing the rest of the sentence so the page turn wouldn't be heard. Um, and that was like, that was a job. But no, my own books or other people's books, I definitely don't deface. And bookmarks, I love a good bookmark. Yep. Absolutely. I'm a reformed page turner, so I'm, I'm very much an advocate <laughs> for the bookmark now. Um, and before we go, can you tell us whether you are a read to the end person or whether you have a ruthless approach to books that you're not enjoying? I used to be um, finish it if it kills you. And now as, you know, the, the parameters around your life contract and you can totally see that this is not going on forever into the horizon. Um, no, if it's not working for me at that time, knowing that it might be a fabulous book, but it's not right, then you've got to have the right book at the right time, I will walk away. Fair enough. You heard it here. Jenny Baldwin's approach, very <laughs> cutthroat. Life's too short, isn't it, to get stuck yeah, in a book that you're is. not enjoying. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, we'll finish. We've got a question from Mary Lou. She was hoping to know whether all your writers, whether they're staff writers or whether people can submit freelance articles. 
We have a, a large pool of contributors around the country. They are they become part of the team because they offer something that we don't already have on the team. Um, they have areas of expertise, specialty that we need. Um, they are nearly always horticulturists. Um, they're certainly gardeners, um, and they're they're often you know they're journalists or um, they they can write. And so we do receive um, people do sometimes send in unsolicited um, stories. And if they do, the ones that cut through are the ones that have kept the brief, the, uh, the, the pitch very short. So it'll be a few sentences at the top that immediately explains why this is a cracker of a story that will fit into this section of the magazine. This is, you know, not just, oh, this is a story your readers will love. Well, well what does that mean? Who, yeah. So um, occasionally something comes through that cuts through but it's rare. I have to say it's rare. So it doesn't mean you shouldn't try, but it's rare. Because okay. uh, I get the volume of email that I receive is um, just nuts. And, um, you know, I have to be, I have to be ruthless how I manage that. And I can't reply to everyone either. So things might have been looked at, but we just can't reply to everybody. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much of, um, yeah, asking that question, Mary Lou. That was a really Thanks, great Mary. challenge question. Yeah. And thank you for being our guest, Jenny, and answering these different oh, questions. Thanks, Maya. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. It's lovely seeing behind the scenes of a magazine, having um, read it from cover to cover for many years. So thank you very much. Right. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Beautiful. Now, our next and final guest tonight is Janine Kimberly from Casey Cardinia Libraries. So, Janine, are you there? And if so, could you turn on your microphone and your camera and Jenny I'll get you to turn your microphone and camera off sure. thank you beautiful now I'll do a little introduction whilst uh, we're getting Janine up on the screen Janine Kimberley has worked at the Casey Cardinia Libraries in Melbourne for over 13 years as a part-time librarian and a part-time author whisperer plus an avid reader now Janine never misses an opportunity to spread the word about good books and especially champions new authors now, the reason that I have asked Janine on our first episode of Library Lovers today was that she plucked my debut novel, Wildflower Ridge, out of the publicity catalogue and she gave it a really enthusiastic endorsement right from the get-go, which as a new author was a huge help. I know I'm not the only one who has benefited from Janine's enthusiastic promotion of Australian authors. Um, and librarians putting hands into the books of readers will never, ever get old. Thank you, Janine, and welcome to Library Lovers. Oh, thank you, Maya. It was an absolute pleasure when you asked me to come on. How could I say no to such a wonderful person? And just to note that Janine has actually interrupted her holiday. She's coming to us from sunny Queensland at the moment uh, to tune in today, which is absolute dedication. This is the type of dedication that we, we have come to be impressed by librarians like this. It's a pleasure. Now, Janine, can you please give us a brief rundown of what Casey Cardinia Libraries offer? Sure. Look, at the library, we offer programs and services to all members of our community. We have children's story time, baby time and tiny time. We run in-branch book groups. We offer online services for students. We have ancestry for people who are researching their family history. And we also have a wonderful network of volunteers that deliver books to our housebound patrons. And we're always there to help on a one-to-one -one basis if needed for people who want to maybe do their resume, set up a device or a phone or help create an email address and they want to know how to download audiobooks and ebooks onto their devices. We help them with downloading the apps and logging in so that they can avail themselves of all the wonderful services that Libby has to offer. And look, there's something for everybody at Casey Cutting Near Library. That's wonderful. And I think one of the best things about libraries is that they're free. They don't cost any Absolutely. <laughs> that's right I think we're one of the only things that is free that's left in this world at the moment it's just wonderful we hope that will never ever change too absolutely now Janine you've also got a top rating book podcast called books matter now is this one of your favorite roles at the library how did you come into um, arranging this podcast well, it was when COVID hit and um, what we did was we thought, well, what can we do? Um, the patrons usually come to us. How can we bring the library to our patrons? 
and that's what happened. Um, we all our children's programs all went online. Our author events all went online. We re even ran our in branch book groups via Zoom, which kept them going, which was just fantastic to have that community engagement with people. And that's when we started up our podcast. And I just had this thought one day. I thought why can't we have a podcast, you know, so that we can get bring all you wonderful authors and everything into the ears of our patrons. So that's where Book Matters started. And we've been very, very fortunate. We're going into our third season at the moment. And um, we were recently rated at number 13 out of the top 30 podcasts in Australia on books and reading. So that was a real, you know, I was so chuffed about that. And we've got a little, a very small team. There's only two or three of us that do it. But um, I think libraries had to evolve when COVID hit and we had to find other ways of reaching our patrons. The other thing that we did too is we started delivering um, books, boxes of books to people because our libraries were closed, our shoots were closed. They couldn't come in and it's just, we had some wonderful feedback from everybody and even people who said that without the books, they wouldn't have known what to do. It literally saved their lives in some ways. And the other good thing about that was that a lot of people discovered brand new authors that they would never have picked up because we had 70% of our collection out on loan at one stage and people could um, request a home delivery and we always have to ask them, what sort of books do you like to read? And they'd, of course, quote certain authors or genres. They'd say, oh, well, I like mystery, I like romance, I like historical fiction. And it, it really put our skills into play to have to go around with the 30% that was left on the shelf and try and find some books to suit people. It was really good. And we've had some wonderful feedback from all our patrons that they really appreciated what we did. Oh, that's lovely, Janine. I think um, that really does, um, you know, go straight to the point of libraries save lives. I think yep. they're, they're so important for people to access no matter how much money they have, where they've come from, yep. what their literacy skills are. It's we don't discriminate. It's wonderful. Well done. Um, I think that's a great reflection of your success, the podcast rating doing so well as well. Congratulations on that. Thank you. <laughs> now, I'd love to know, Janine, why libraries are special to you. So obviously you're a librarian. Could you share a little story about um, your time as a librarian or perhaps something from your childhood visits to the library? Oh, look, I remember, you know, coming home from school as a kid and the only place I wanted to go was the library. And my mother used to take me down there and she'd leave me there while she went and had a cup of tea or something like that. And of course, things were very different in those days. Um, nothing was electronic at all. We had all, you know, you borrowed a book and there was a little card in the back, you know, and you had your return date. And um, sometimes there were things called the stacks, which people didn't know about and how the librarian would be able to go out the back and if you requested a book and they'd go out to this magical area and bring that book back and it wasn't on the shelf and it was just for you. That was something that I really, really um, remember. But look, it's the best job in the world to have. And I think as a reader, if you can work in a library, you have the best job in the whole world. And I love every minute of it. I really do. And I think we're an industry too that is changing because things have to change, you know, with our online resources, with e-books and e-audio books. I mean, they weren't around when I was a kid. Um, and there's always something new happening at the library. And I mean, one of the biggest things that we're looking forward to this year is hopefully without any COVID, we hope, is bringing people back. That's the thing because everyone's been at home and we just want to bring people back. The kids' programs are starting up again, which, you know, just to see the look on the kids' faces, you know, they're delight to come into the library we're now getting some real live authors coming in which is just fantastic you know because patrons love or readers love to actually get the opportunity to ask their you know favorite authors questions to <clears throat> to have that book of theirs signed personally by an author I mean I've got my my keeper bookshelf at home that's got all my signed copies on it means a lot to a, a dedicated reader so um yeah so we just want people to come back that's wonderful, Janine. Um, as a prolific reader as well, I really, uh, I know you'll find it so hard to make a recommendation because you do have so many books come across your desk. Um, you've got publishers sending them yep. because they know what a wonderful advocate you are for Aussie authors. Yep. And you get lots of advanced copies. We can really tell that you're passionate about the books. That comes through so strongly. Uh, is it possible that you could narrow it down to a book recommendation for us tonight? Actually, I do. I've got this one here, which I hope you can see. 
It's, yes. <clears throat> it's called The Understudy, and it's by a brand new Australian author called Julie Bennett. And it's her first novel, and it takes us behind the scenes of the world of opera. Um, it's set around the opening of the Sydney Opera House, which was in the 1970s. And um, it's a great novel. It's a real page turner. It's full of mystery, drama, intrigue, with a bit of a touch of romance too. Now, the interesting thing about Julie is she's a graduate of Fiona McIntosh's Masterclass Program, which is producing some fantastic Australian writers, and also Mary Lou Stevens, who wrote The Last of the Apple Blossoms, I believe, also went through that program. Um, and she's just churning out so many good writers. And um, it's a, this one's a really good one. If you like women's fiction, you'll really enjoy reading that. That one was a five-star read for me. Oh, fantastic, Jean. It does sound wonderful. I know that um, yeah, Mary Lou says that she's read the book as well and absolutely yep. loved it. It's a sexy page turner. So <laughs> I've heard some really good things about it too. So thank you for that recommendation. Pleasure. Now, um, before we uh, turn off, there's a couple more beautiful comments, people saying that you have such a passion and love for people and books, and that's very clear. That's um, Beck was looking for your podcast and she's now found it. If you look for Casey Cardinia Library's Book Matters uh, yes. on, on Spotify, people can find it through their Apple podcast. Is that right? Yes, we're, we're just about everywhere. Well, just your, your usual podcast provider, you'll find it. Or if, if you're struggling, just go to our website and do a search for Book Matters podcast and you can listen to it there as well. Oh, wonderful. And are you an audiobook, digital reader or paperback type of person? I'm getting the feeling, Janine, that you're all three. I am. I am. I, I, I read a book and it can be either an e-book or an actual paperback book. And at the same time, on to and from work, I listen to an audio book in the car. That way I can sort of kill two birds with one stone. I'm, I know some people can read multiple books at once. I can't do that. But I feel if I'm reading one and I'm listening to one, provided they're not the same genre, because once upon a time I was listening to a crime novel and reading a crime novel and I'm driving along and all of a sudden I'm listening, I'm thinking, but what happened to such and such? And then I thought, oh my God, that's in the other book. So now I always make it a plan to either read two different genres so that I don't get confused. Well, look, throw in writing a book as well, Jean. You can get yourself royally confused. <laughs> <laughs> oh, beautiful. Now, before you sign off, can you please tell us something that's happening in your personal garden or your kitchen at the moment, Janine, given the oh. theme of our first two guests? I know you're great at scones. Oh, and where did I get that scone recipe from, Maya? <laughs> I wonder. Yes, um, I would recommend everybody please go onto Maya's website and download her scone recipe because they are now the go-to scone recipe in my house. They are Maya's scone. But the other thing in my garden, this year has been a fantastic year for roses. It really has. And I mean, roses treat them mean. You don't have to do anything special with them, but just the best thing you can do is just keep on picking them. And I've had vases of roses in my house all summer. The other thing, um, it's jam making season at my place because I have two dwarf white peaches, which when I bought them, uh, the tag said it may or may not produce fruit. And I thought, that's okay. That's fine. Well, every year I get more and more. And so I actually went to the library, borrowed a book, learned how to make peach jam and that's what I've been doing lately I've done my back my latest batch of jam that's all sitting at home so there's always something to do oh wonderful Janine what a lovely note to finish on <laughs> well, thank you very much for being our guest Janine and Sophie and Jenny as well now just a reminder that Sophie's books and the Gardening Australia magazines are all available on the Libby catalogue so if it's not available through your local library please ask your friendly librarians to order it in. Now if you love novels that'll make your heart race and you want to find out more about the process behind writing books then don't miss Ben's book club it's next Tuesday night on zoom it's also brought to you by Libby Overdrive on behalf of your local library. Now, Ben Hobson, he's an Aussie author, he's based in Queensland, and his guest, the very first book club Zoom session, is Mary Rose Cuss Kelly. So she'll be talking about her new thriller, The, the Cane, which sounds absolutely fascinating. I think I'll need to, um, you know, not be too scared to read that one. She's really good at gripping you and uh, holding you with that. And I'd also love people to join us next month too for the April episode of Library Lovers with me, Maya Linnell, and the Libby app. 
I'll be interviewing Fleur McDonnell next month, and I'll also be speaking with an audiobook publisher from Wave Sound Australia. It'll be on April the 20th with a special guest, Vicky, from the Blue Mountains Libraries as well. And there's so much more in the pipeline. We have got more Gardening Australia. We'll have Phil Dudman coming on in June with the changing of the season. And there's plenty more. So stay tuned. It's all coming to you free from the comfort of your own home. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in again. It really was lovely to have your company. So stay well, happy baking, happy gardening, and happy reading.